This is everything right here. Everything else plays out of your understanding the process of, that makes you eventually end up where you end up. Thoughts to destiny. And what goes on between those two. Because if you don't have that right, it doesn't matter what you learn and how much information I give you. If you're not going to understand, the, <laughs> where, once the information goes in your head, what happens to it? It goes in your heart if you let it. Some of it doesn't that should, and some of it does that shouldn't. Information's available in all kinds of forms. And so some of the stuff that should go in your heart doesn't. Some of the stuff that shouldn't does. You have to be the, you got to show mayor your heart. You have to be the watchman over your mind, over your thoughts. You got to be the gatekeeper over what's going on in your head. Because it starts with pondering or dwelling on. I use the word meditate, but people think of that much more in an Eastern philosophy, sort of way, like, oh, I'm thinking about this thing. No. But I'm saying, think of it from the idea of pondering, thinking about it, dwelling on it, maintaining it in your thought. Instead of, instead of thinking about it for a second or two, you're thinking about it all day. And for now a couple of days. And then you're thinking about it for a month. Guess what? Eventually, you're going to act upon what you're thinking about all the time. I mean, that's the important thing that we understand. Okay, this is the part now we call it the afterburn. If you are uh, wanting to participate in this, basically you can raise your hand and we'll go ahead and pass the microphone around. You can ask questions about this teaching today. We'll include even some of the other parts if you want to go back into some of the other stuff, but mostly I want it to be about today. We're not going to take more than, say, 15, 20 minutes on this, but you're welcome to make comments or ask questions. If you're online, you can ask them of Robert. Now, if I touched on something, because maybe you're new, you haven't heard all of the other teachings, sometimes I assume you know where I'm going because you've heard the other stuff. We may send you to a teaching before we answer your questions. Don't be offended. Don't get frustrated. Don't be impatient. It would be unfair to me or Robert if you call like during the week to answer your question in a soundbite, two or three minutes worth of an answer that took, say, seven hours of seven parts to teach. That would be unfair to you because now you're being expected to come to the same conclusion that someone who would have taken seven hours to come to in two minutes. You know, we were trying to look for a fee site, and some of the places we called asked us that they said they need a copy of our statement of beliefs. We don't have one. Why? Because it would be unfair to put out a one sentence, three sentence, well, there it goes. Okay, to put out a one sentence or three sentence statement that has no context. See, people are expecting the standard stuff. I'm a Trinitarian, I'm not a Trinitarian. I believe in this, I believe. They're expecting those standard one-liner things that everybody has on their website. But we don't have that. Why? Because we believe, what I believe about salvation and the nature of the Godhead and all these other things is very different than everybody else. So would that be fair for me to put it in a soundbite when it took five parts to explain salvation? What was it, 14 parts for grace? And so... This is the same for all of you. If you ask a question, I may say, listen to this teaching first, or maybe a couple of teachings, whatever it is to answer you, and then if you still have questions, call me back. And you know what happens? Most of the time, they don't call back, either because it answered their questions or they didn't like it. <laughs> so if you have a question about also things that are peripheral, meaning I touched on them, but they're not actually the core of the teaching, we may not answer it today. We may ask you to go and call us during the week, etc. So who wants to start us off? Okay, Dawid, go ahead. Um, so you kind of touched on this a little bit in the last of your comments uh, after your message. Um, so the, what I was going to say was basically like this. When wrong thoughts occur to me, I should actively think about something else that I'm already supposed to be thinking about and um, basically think Torah actively. Okay, that's part of it. That's good. What you first want to do is actively decide what to do with the thought. Don't just ignore it and try to think about something else. There's a reason the thought popped in your head. So now actively just make it, take a moment and decide, what am I doing with that thought? Oh, I don't need that thought. Discard it, now put something else in its place. Oh, that's a good thought. Let me ponder on it or make sure I think about it later because I need to, that may be something I need to really be doing. So you want to actively be aware of the process that's happening automatically. A thought comes in your head it may just automatically, without the gatekeeping, just go right into your heart and stuff goes, you know, you start meditating on it. You first decide what to do with every thought. 
That's the idea of taking it captivity. Okay, that means you now own the thought. You've captivated, you've captured it, you've taken it into captivity, now you have to decide what to do with it. Am I setting it free? Am I making it a part of who I am? What am I doing with this thought? All right? Don't just let stuff pop in your head and go wherever it wants. Then, if it's one that you feel you don't need, it's a wrong thought, then actively put something else in because even wrong thoughts are hard to get out of your head. And you find yourself going back to it and your mind goes back to it and your mind goes back to it. So now actively put something else in your head. Okay? Good question. All right, next person. Okay, Diana. I have a question about the blind leading the blind on the stumble in the middle of twilight. Um, is that referring to Torah? They're blinded by Torah. They don't see Torah. Well, the reference to the blind leading the blind is saying literally if a blind person is leading a blind person, they're going to fall into a ditch because they can't see where they're going. So therefore, you don't want to just be learning from somebody who doesn't really know where they're going. That also brings us back to the point in, in Deuteronomy and in Isaiah, which was talking about the idea that <coughs> part of the cursing would be that we're walking around thinking we know what we're doing, but we're just grasping around in the darkness like a blind person would, even if in the middle of the day they can't. It's not any lighter for them that the, the sun is bright in the sky as if it was midnight. They still can't see where they're going because they literally are blind. And so we are blind when we're not allowing ourselves to see the way, the path, the light, the truth, the Torah, Yeshua, etc., all that stuff. Okay, what does that result in? It results in ending up in a wrong place, ending up in places you don't want to be, like in a ditch. The ditch one is really all about choosing your teacher. Okay, you're blind. You don't know where you're going. So you look for someone to guide you. So are you going to grab a blind person to guide you? Not a good choice. You can't see where you're going because let's say you're literally, let's say we'll put this in a physical sense. You're physically blind and you need to go from here to the other room where we do Oneg. <clears throat> and you've not been there before, so it's not like you've learned a route and you kind of have your way. Because I know blind people that can get on. I've seen blind people get around places that they're familiar with. They don't even need their cane or anything. They just get up, they know how many steps, and they know where they're going. But let's say it's someplace you've never been before and you need somebody to guide you there. Are you going to ask another blind person to do it? Probably not. Probably a bad idea. And that's what we do, though, when we allow our friends and family members and coworkers and everybody else to become our teachers who may not necessarily be qualified to do it. Go find a qualified person to teach you, a person that you have vetted to see that they have the information and they have a very good grasp of it and they can actually share it with you because it actually leads to the destiny you're looking for. Okay, when I first moved here, and even a little bit still, I've only been here six years. When I first moved here, I was so happy when I, I became more friendly with two or three of the people that have been here a long time. Because people would ask me about things like, you know, when they came to visit or something like, where's a good restaurant or a good hotel? I don't know. Although, no, better yet, this is what they'll say to me. I was looking online and I found a hotel on Shallowford Road. Well, you know what? When I first moved here, I didn't know where that was. So I couldn't tell them if that was close to where we I didn't know. So that's, again, the blind leading the blind. If, if I were to try to advise somebody, and I don't, I've only lived here five minutes, I don't know anything about the area. How am I supposed to help you? But you find somebody who knows the path, knows where the pits are and where the landmines are, knows how to guide you. Okay, does that answer your question? Okay. Um, you mentioned about parents taking care of your parents. Do we still hold on to that, or it's something that... Remember, we're talking about being in the land with the way the inheritance laws were, the way that the inheritance that was given to the children, literally, they would give the inheritance to the children before they died, and then the children were obligated to use some of that inheritance to take care of their parents, like a retirement program, okay? We don't do that today, Okay. Most of us, our parents and us, have no inheritance. <laughs> so there isn't anything to work with. But let's say I had wealth of $100,000 or whatever, just a number, okay? And you were my child, and I know I'm getting on and close to passing at some point. I'm at older age, and it could be even 5, 10, or 15 years away, but I'm getting to that point where I want to, you know what? You take over the family business, which was farming or cattle or whatever it was, or carpentry or something. You take that over, and I'm going to give you, you have full authority, over the whole thing, but I'm depending on you to take care of me. 
Okay, that was the way things were done then. They're not done that way now. So it's not that we're not obligated to that. The point was we honor and respect our parents in a different way. They had to give honor and respect to the parents based on the way they did things in those days. And this was disrespectful of parent to be given all that wealth, to be given all that inheritance, and then not use it to take care of their parents. That make sense? Okay. I had an observation because I seem to have just seen this today when you were reading the passage in Matthew 15. And uh, he's quoting out of uh, Isaiah and he says, but in vain you worship me, teaching for teachings the commandments of men. So worship, the connection between worship and teaching, I, I just saw that. I didn't know if... No, that's it. great. And that's part of the what is worship teaching. So people want to go there. I, I, I wanted to get more into some of the things, Marty, like what you just said. But that's, I didn't get to Matthew until I was really out of time on my clock here. So I would have taken a lot longer with those 15 verses. But that's a great point. Okay, because once we get to the word worship, I should have either mentioned the teaching on it, but let's understand worship is not just somehow an emotional thing and we sway our arms or some other thing. Worship has to do with instruction, has to do with obedience, has to do with doing what he said. There's a whole, it's four parts, not a big one. Okay, what is worship? Because see, again, we've been misled, not necessarily on purpose, but we've all called what happens on the stage with the music, we call that worship. We call it the worship team. Well, it's praise. By pure definition, it's not worship. Now, he does tell us to praise him and to sing and use instruments, so I guess in some levels, that will work its way in. But we're mixing things together, which is not a surprise. Christianity loves to either mix things together that don't belong together or separate things that are not supposed to be separated. So it's kind of, you know, one or the other, okay? Can you clarify about the blood of Jesus? how you said um, anything you did before the blood of Jesus was, didn't count or wasn't significant, and anything you do after the blood of Jesus is significant. Can you clarify that for me, please? Only if you can start saying Yeshua instead of Jesus. Okay, Yeshua. Okay. Um, realize this. When you did not know Torah and you did not know Messiah... Really, everything you did didn't matter because you were not being held to anything because there wasn't any standard to hold you to. So when you came to know the truth, what did you naturally do? You said, wow, am I sorry about all these dumb things I did that I shouldn't have been doing? And so the blood then get, brings forgiveness and covers you more than just the forgiveness, the idea that it covers you. Remember, the connection that people have had struggle with is the idea of what Messiah did relative to the fact that he died and that being connected in some way to offerings and sacrifices. The only connection you should be making is that it's a covering like the lamb's blood on the doorpost caused death to pass over. His blood on you causes death to pass over. By that metaphor, he's the lamb of God, the lamb of Yah, because he causes death to pass over you. Now, when you were, Ephesians chapter 2, you were in ignorance, you were in the world, you didn't know anything about anything, really everything you did didn't really matter to him from that point of view because really until he called you and showed you, it was his fault, not yours. I'm being honest and open, right? If you don't know, you don't know. How many times have you ever said to somebody who said to you you did something wrong that you didn't know? You said, well, I didn't know. Anybody ever do that? And they got all mad at you, like, why are you mad at me? You never told me not to do that. You never told me that was the wrong way, right? People get mad at you. Why'd you do that? I never told you to do that. That's right. You never told me. So how do I know? I didn't know. Sorry. Okay? But once you are covered, you can't, you're not going to be covered until you come into the knowledge of truth. Until he draws you and shows you, then you choose now to walk in covenant. Now as a covenanted person, the blood covers you. The blood doesn't cover everybody. It was made available to cover everybody. Let's not get confused. The blood doesn't cover everybody. Potentially it could. He wanted it to. But it won't because not everybody's going to choose to covenant. It only covers those who are covenanted. Because those who are covered don't die. Or they get to have eternal life when they get resurrected. They don't have the second death. 
And so to be covered, you have to stay on the path. Remember we talked about the path covered by the blood. If you get off the path, guess what? You've stepped out from the protection. You're not covered. If you were in Egypt and it was Passover, it was that, 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 that night, the meal, if you had gone outside of your door, out of your house, and you were firstborn, you were going to die. Doesn't matter that there was blood on your house. Doesn't matter that you had been covered for a few minutes. But then once you walked outside, guess what? All bets are off. Don't fall into that Christianese idea that somehow once you come to Messiah in some sort of knowledge or understanding, you're in. Nothing else matters. You're in. You're covered. No. Listen to the Are You Saved teaching. Understand that your choices all the way to the end is what's going to make the difference. Anybody ever have a relationship with somebody where they sounded like they were either going to be your friend or they were going to be dependable in some way on a project or, as a, or work with you on a, at a job thing or whatever it was, and then they turned out that they were so committed and so excited and that didn't last a whole long time? Anybody remember, have that happen? Whether it was months, weeks, or a year or whatever? The person seemed like they were going to be great. And then all of a sudden something changed. But they knew, they were excited, they were committed. And probably when they did split, it got ugly too. That's, our, that's all relationships. That's our relationship with him. When you covenant with him, that brings you under the blood. The blood's been there for everybody. Yeshua said, I give my life for everybody. Are we understanding this? Okay? He says, I give my life for the whole world. So the whole world has the opportunity to come under that covenant and covering. But you have to choose to come under it. That requires submission because the covenant is he speaks, we do. He speaks, we listen, we do. And when you're ready to do that, guess what? It brings protection, blessing, transformation, all the things that have happened when you're covered. But nothing keeps you from stepping off the road. All of us do it all the time. It's not safe out there. I wouldn't stay out there very long. <laughs> Teshuvah. What does that mean? To turn around and get back on that. All right? Does that answer the question? Okay. You're welcome. Okay. And I'm not picking on you. I know a lot of people, it's hard to get that Christianese thing with the Jesus thing and everything else out of there. Go back and re-listen to Beware False Prophets. Kind of got to break that habit. We got to get that out of there because that's part of a setup. Okay? Have you heard that teaching yet? Be, okay, you're going to need to listen to that teaching. Then you'll understand, <laughs> okay? So I'm not picking on you, but there's, there's actually a reason for that. It's not semantics. It's not just a pronunciation thing. There's a reason. But you have to listen to the Beware False Prophets teaching to understand it, which we are going to probably redo just because it's fun to redo it every now and then. <laughs> and maybe it'll be longer because this time I won't feel like I have to stick it. Well, actually, this last time it was on two CDs because it was like an hour and a half. It went like 90 minutes or something the last time, so... Anyway, we've got a lot of work to do. One of these days, I would like to write something new, too. <laughs> well, actually, almost all the times that I rewrite the old ones, it's all new anyway, right? I mean, think about what we covered in Endure, right? Endure was one part, then it was this big thing, and now we'll look at seven parts of what are you thinking, and we've got at least another, I don't know, one or two or three left to go with all the notes I've got. Kirk. I just wanted to... Uh, clarify something you said earlier in the teaching um, when talking to your brothers and sisters uh, in conversation, casual conversation, is it okay to talk about theological ideas, different, different ideas before you it, check with? It's not a problem to share with people if, they're, if you're going to be reasonably ready and prepared to see whether or not they're open to it. Okay? I don't want you to keep your mouth shut about what you believe. When I say leave them alone means it's not your job to go pester them and save them and convince them. That's what I mean by leave them alone. I don't mean like ignore them. Leave them alone is different than ignoring them. Okay? Don't bother them, pester them, push them, prod them, poke them, uh, embarrass them, guilt them, whatever it is, you know? Because we're going to start getting to that all over again on Facebook as we get closer to Easter now. Because everybody's going to be out there putting all those postings about how false Easter is and it's not about Ishtar, it's not about eggs, it's not about rabbits, blah, 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 blah. 
We get this a few times a year. Christmas and Easter are two of the biggest ones. Just leave them alone. They don't know. They can't receive what you're trying to give them. They're not ready for it. And it's not you that's going to fix that. Don't think, and by the way, don't be condescending and look down to them either. You were them not that long ago. Okay? So that doesn't make you any more special or any more anything. It just means that you are where you are and they are where they are. So just thank God you're where you are. All right? But pray for him to bring them to where you are. Hey, open their eyes. You call them, draw them. But then you be ready if they're drawn to you to answer their questions or to lead them to an anointed appointed who can answer their questions. Okay? Does that make sense? All right. All right. From uh, Yanni, uh, a comment. The thought which led to action and then to habit is a way to become a new man. It will be the way to, we live life in the Torah, and we become one in, and we become one in and with the Torah. Yes, good comment. Okay, look, if I start thinking, let's say I normally drink five cups of coffee a day, um, eat something like fast food for lunch, um, binge out on some ice cream and cake for dinner. And then let's say I change, change my thinking to, that's not necessarily a healthy thing to do. Maybe I need to cut back. Maybe I need to eat some salads and green things. Maybe I need to eat some fruits and, and, with the, you know, and vegetables and stuff. Maybe I need to drink different things. Do you think that would make me a new man if I actually lived that for a period of time? Okay, physically, health-wise, and everything else? Why wouldn't that work for anything? If you think differently and then you act differently, it takes you to a different destiny. Whether that's a destiny, you can, by the way, do that with your career. Those of you that are having financial issues, think differently about money and careers and get emotional about it, take different actions, you'll end up in a different career. If the destiny I'm looking for is my health, think differently about health. If it's money, think differently about money. If it's the, the kingdom, think differently about what gets you to the kingdom. Whatever it is that you want to get, where, what's the destiny that you're looking for? It doesn't just have to be this big thing like death or the kingdom. <laughs> I mean, that's one of them. That's the biggest one you need to think about. But what about all these other destinies? I'm single. I'd like to get married someday. Okay, what do you need to do to become ready and prepared so that can happen? And by the way, when I get married, the destiny I want is a marriage that works and is good and it, and it lasts, okay? Well, maybe there's some thinking and actions and other things that you have to do to prepare that that'll work out. Maybe I'd like to have children. Well, guess what? Most people have children. They walk in and go, go to the hospital. They have the baby. The hospital says, here's your baby. And they go, ha, ha, ha. Now what do I do? I know. I'll ask my parents because after all, they did such a great job. Okay, so. And you wonder where generational cursing comes from. So, but if you want to be a great parent, even before you have children, you could start thinking about things and desiring to be a great parent and then learning what it would take to be a great parent. And then you'll watch people parent and you'll observe what they do and see what works and what doesn't work and ask questions and everything else. All right? One thing I want to warn you not to do, don't read a book, listen to a video, and then go up to every parent and try and straighten them out. Because the first thing they're going to look at you and say, it doesn't work like that in real life. Okay? Well, that's not necessarily true, but you don't really understand the differences between what they're dealing with with real children and what the person was talking about in the book or the video. Okay, because if you haven't had children, you don't know. <laughs> I don't care how good or bad they are, until you have them, you just really don't know. You know, I felt almost in, in, inadequate to ministry when I first started ministry. I'd been married for like five minutes, and I had no children. And so when people wanted to counsel... I couldn't tell them anything about marriage or children. And now I've been married almost 20 years and I've got two. I feel a little bit better qualified. Okay? But when I first started, not the case. People would come up to me. My, my, you know, my, my, my wife and I are fighting. My husband and I are fighting. I'm on my honeymoon still. I don't know what to tell you. We're still, everything's great. Of course, now after 20 years, we're still that way. But you understand what I'm saying? I don't know about that stuff. 
Well, my teenager, I don't have any teenagers. I don't know anything about teenagers. I was one. I mean, I know that, but, you know. Anyway, so you understand what I'm saying? And that's when we get into the blind leading the blind stuff like Diana was asking about. If you go in and ask people that don't have, don't have any idea because they have never had that experience or they've never been through what you're going through, it's going to be a little tough because they don't understand. They have no context or framework. All right? Bill Hamill said that he came in late. Uh, could you tell him what scripture it was regarding only matters what we do from here on in? It was a combination of scripture. Okay, we're going back to Isaiah 59, verse 7. Let's start all over again. We want to catch Bill up to what he missed. <laughs> um, I was just connecting a bunch of dots. I think I was in Ephesians 2 connecting to something in Isaiah 57. and it, I mean, 59, sorry, 59, and somewhere between 7 and verse 20, and it was just connecting some dots together, okay? Um, we were not anywhere else at that point, so I can't tell you what specific verse. Um, it probably has to do with, in Ephesians 2, and when it says, and we were without Elohim, so I'll give you the verse that was likely here, hold on. Okay, so it's probably, yeah, verse 11, 12, okay? Oh, no, ver all the way to 13, where we were brought near by the blood, all right? Okay, so it was 11 through 13, in Ephesians 2, but it was connected to a bunch of stuff we're talking about Isaiah 59, okay, and Deuteronomy 28. So that's kind of where we were. All right? All right. From Lori, um, she says, she loves what you said, leave them alone, referring to Jews, Christians, and Gentiles. Uh, she has never been comfortable with street ministry, et cetera, and she is wondering if there is a role for missionaries or is this just a Christian idea? Well, there's a role for missionaries, but missionaries have a role of not trying to bring people to, but to go and, and take care of those that have needs who have already, already come to, or we're just going to go help them regardless of whether or not they believe what we believe. Okay, mission work should be, the, well, well, you have to ask the question, what's the mission? Okay, I mean, if I send you on a mission... Or a task, what's, what do you, you know, you, you should know what you're going to go do. Is the mission to bring people to Messiah? Well, that's the wrong mission. It's not your job. Is the mission to feed people that are starving and help give them, you know, a, a healthy environment to live in so they're not all dying from terrible diseases? Well, go do that, regardless of what they believe. Is your mission to go help plant congregations in places where there's people that don't know what to do, but they're part of what we're doing? They get, they, they, you know, they're on the same page. They just don't have anybody to plant a congregation. So go do that. There's lots of different missions we could be on. See, but remember, Christian missions goes back to the whole evangelizing in their understanding of what evangelizing is to go and convert people. To go and convert people, to go and force that thought process on people. I know starving people without homes who can come over and I can put them in a room and give them a bed and feed them, that's a great captive audience. Sit down and be quiet and let me talk to you. That's what they do. I'm being probably over exaggerating on some lows, but that's what they do. If you don't sit here, you don't get to eat. You eat, you listen. You want to eat again, come back tomorrow, listen to some more. That's almost Pavlovian. Do you believe in Christ? Absolutely. Can I have more potatoes? <laughs> They're sitting there. <laughs> like the Pavlovian dog thing. Okay, yeah, I'm hungry, I'm hungry. Okay, say, tell me you believe in Christ. Oh, yeah, I believe in Christ. Can I have some butter, please? Okay. That's kind of what they're doing, which is why when they leave, it all falls apart because they're only doing it because they didn't have a choice. Abba gives us all of this so, because he knows we have a choice and he wants us to choose. And so, yes, if we did missions to feed people, if they asked us why we were doing it, we would tell them, because I believe, according to Matthew 25, that we are to help our, our, the people in, who are hungry, people that are thirsty. And so I do this because of my belief in him. And then they may ask you more about it or not. And it shouldn't matter if they do or don't. If the mission is to feed, shelter, and clothe, then, then we go out and feed, shelter, and clothe. The problem is that the Messianic world, the Torah-observant Israelite world, 
We don't have enough cohesive working together yet. MTOI is trying to develop that when we're bringing people together to work together to serve the body more effectively, where there could be enough wealth or funding to do those things because those things cost money. You need funds to send somebody over to another country or even within your own country to go where the poor people are, to take care of them and feed them and clothe them, whatever is necessary. That takes funds. And guess what? We as a congregation, forget the live stream for a second. I'm not saying forget you guys, just hold on. But if it was just us, 70, 80 people, what could we really do in, a, in the big picture things on a missions work? We can maybe go to some homeless shelters and help out a little bit or start a little food bank or something, but are we going to be able to do anything really like go to countries where they're really living in squalor and nothing? No. There's, no, there's not enough money here. But when you add in the live stream and the growth and the expansion that we're having, at some point we may be able to do those things because that stuff simply takes the financial wherewithal to do. But again, to answer the question, it all depends on what your mission is. What's the, what's the goal? What are we trying to accomplish? What we're not going to do is we're not going to go out there and try to convince people to do what we're doing. We'll help them do it if they want. Not going to convince them of anything. I mean? Now, I know I'm really strong at the mic, but if you ever counsel with me, you're not going to hear me saying to you, what's wrong with you? You're not doing this. You better go over and start doing it. I don't do that. That's between you and him. From the microphone, I'm just, I'm trying to be his mouthpiece. Okay, so I'm speaking and saying what I need to say. What you do with it is what you do with it. But if you come to me, I may point out, by the way, some of this is happening because you're not doing this. You might want to think about that. From Lola, what happens when someone believes their thoughts are right and are convinced, but others don't agree? How can one test it if all are against you? Oh, so you try, you're trying, okay, so you, I think you're trying to talk about how do you test your own thought if everybody disagrees with you? Okay, first of all, don't necessarily think you're right because they disagree with you or think you're wrong just because everybody disagrees with you. What you're going to have to do is you're going to have to look out there and ask Abba, Abba, lead me to an anointed appointed who I can talk to to find out where I may be going off the rails here or where, I'm, where maybe I'm right. Okay, you can't, especially if what the ideas you're being given are so different than where you came from. If you've been sitting your whole life in one of a mainstream denominational churches, and all of a sudden the thought came to you that maybe you're supposed to be like keeping Saturday and Shabbat. Okay, well that discussion might not go very well by just talking to the other people sitting on Sunday in the church that you were going to. Maybe you need to find somebody that keeps Shabbat and ask them about it. You understand? Look for the person, even though you're, the, your, uh, your normal circle of influence is not those people, now you're going to have to go look for some new people. You're going to have to find some new people to talk to. That doesn't mean just throw all the old ones out. I'm still friends with a lot of people that are in the world and keep nothing and do nothing. I mean, I'm not friendly, meaning I spend a lot of time with them. But these are people I grew up with. I love them. They love me. You know what I'm saying? I just don't allow them to influence me. And quite frankly, mostly they try to make sure I don't influence them. So we don't spend as much time together as we used to. Amy says, is an intercessor one who admonishes? If so, does this work in relationships between believers? How does this work in relationships between believers? Iron sharpens iron. Okay, now I know this is tough. I don't know which Amy this is, so it doesn't matter. But the point is, if you've been listening for a while, th this is one of those challenges as a teacher. And I'm not picking on Amy. This happens a lot. But I've tried to make this point a thousand times. I'll make it again. It's it's, unless it's actually your job, you don't do these things. Or the person has given you permission to. If you have a relationship with somebody and they say, and they say, look, if you ever see me going off on, you know, going going off the rails a little bit, I give you permission to come and admonish me to get to get my attention. But if you've not done that, then the only person who's allowed to do that is the person who actually has that job, and it's not everybody just because you're now in belief, so to speak. It's only those in leadership who have that role. And because that role means that if you're in this congregation, we have a default relationship. Whether I, I didn't have to ask you, by the way, is it okay if I admonish you? You're sitting here. You've given me that authority to some degree. 
But if you don't have a relationship where that's understood, no, you don't get to admonish people. I know your friend's doing something you think is wrong and you want to correct them. Sorry, it's not your job to do it. Unless you have a relationship that they've invited you to do it. So it either has to be your job, your role, or relational. Does that make sense? Okay. All right, Tim Barnes, much of what you spoke of in Isaiah speaks of a situation that he's in. How can he repent and go forward when someone like a parent insists you're wrong? How can you honor your parent and still repent? Okay, this is, I'm going to need more information than that, but I'll try to give a sort of ballpark idea. Let's understand, and this is coming up more and more and more. A lot of us have older parents. A lot of us are, you know, in our 30s, 40s, 50s, whatever. We still have parents around, and they don't like the decisions you're, still, you're making now. And they may even start to try to treat you like you're still 12, okay? However, honoring, let's see, look, we have Exodus and you have Deuteronomy with the Ten Commandments. Let's use the one that says respect, because that's really the better word for it, for what we're talking about here. Treat them with respect. The honor word comes in by not shaming, okay? It's not so much honoring, like in an active way, but let's not shame them. Don't embarrass them. Don't use language inappropriate. Don't treat them like they're children. They're still your parent. But in a respectful way, say, I know you don't like this. I know you don't agree, but this is my life. I'm now an adult. I now have walked out of your house and have lived my own life. I have to live with my choices. I need you to respect that too. If you can't, that's your choice. I'm, I, I'm, you know, I'm going to have to spend less time with you. If you're going to treat me in a way that's, you know, I, I'm not going to keep putting myself back into the buzzsaw every time I come and interact with you. So that's your choice. That's not just, they say, oh, well, you, you're, that's being, you're disrespecting me. No. You've created a relationship that I, that's, that's not workable. So I'm not cursing you. I'm not yelling at you. I'm not using wrong language or anything. I'm just telling you, if you cannot respect my walk, and you're going to give me grief and my kids' grief and your, you know, your grand, you know, their, their grandchildren and all this other stuff. Every time we meet, I'm not coming. And you're not invited. That's not disrespectful. That's not dishonoring. Now, if you take that information and start to try to embarrass them in public and tell your, your siblings about it, and every, in other words, what you do and how you do it is going to bring them shame or an attempt to shame them because maybe you want their baby behavior to change. Because they do it to you. They try to shame you into doing what they want. That's a parenting kind of tool. It's not necessarily a good one. But they'll try to shame their children. And they'll talk to, they'll say, well, I talked to your brother and your sister and blah, 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 blah. See, they're trying to shame you. Don't shame them back. Just say, mom, dad, whoever it is, this is who I am. I'm walking out my own salvation with fear and trembling. If you can't respect that, I understand. I don't, you know, it's not what I would rather, but I understand. But because of that, I'm not subjecting myself or the children to this every time you're around. So now you have a choice. You can change the way you treat me and the children or not see us. That's not disrespect. That's not dishonoring. Okay? Mom, Dad... If something happens to you, I'll be there. If you need me for anything, call me. I'll be there. But I'm not going to subject myself to this every time we get together. <laughs>